Hi, uh, welcome to our book review of The Queen of Romance um, by Liz Jones. Um, we have joining us the lovely Gwen Davies, um, Josh Aldred, Amy Thomas and Cormac Whiteway. Um, all of us have read the book, which is a great start. And uh, we'll hopefully be discussing some of the themes and uh, some favourite quotes and such throughout the session. Gwen, would you like to start us off? Favourite moments? Oh, I thought it was really entertaining. Here it is. It was because it kind of dips into lots of different worlds. Um, so you've got a romance novelist. Um, so she draws another romance novelist like Gertie Ruck. Um, she talks about suffragist movement and different changes coming up between between the wars and after the war. Um, and I thought it was really fasc fascinating. She's a very fascinating woman who's all these different, many, many different pseudonyms as a, as a romance, romantic writer. Lovely, thank you. Um, I, I definitely agree with you on the pseudonym part, but that's, that's a rant for slightly later on. Josh, do you want to go next? Uh, yep. Yeah, um, I really liked it, but God, I hate, I hate Margaret. I'm, I just hate her. She is the worst. Everyone in her life is the worst, but she is so, she's so, so bad. Like, I, I really, really wanted to like her, but it was like, and I, and I did, like, the first, like, four chapters, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I love her, I love her, someone I can root for, and then, like, oh, my God, what a mess, what a, she was such a mess, and that's fine, because I agree with it, but I also don't bully maids, so, like, I'm not that bad, but that was a mess. Um, I really did like it though. Like it's so well written and so well researched. Like uh, Liz Jones did like an incredible job of this, and like how it's all framed. Even it was like the this is like the only biography that I've actually been so hooked by that I literally finished it in like a, like a day and a half. Like I took like one break, went to sleep, woke up, read all day. Like I was very hooked by it. It's really good, even though the protagonist is like a steaming mess. Sorry. Wow. What a lovely controversial opinion we have there. Um, I also agree with some parts of that though. So, you know, you're not alone in that respect. Um, next okay, up, Amy. Her taste in men. Her taste in men is just abysmal, um, which seems to be the root of most of her problems, to be honest. Like, find yourself a nice man, Margaret. Like, <laughs> sort it out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I really loved it. Um, yeah, I got so into it as well I really wasn't expecting to be so into it and I think it's because the style it's written in is very dramatic which perfectly suits the character they're talking about the person they're talking about um you know the sort of in the time when she's desperately trying to become an actress trying to become a journalist and like that sort of constant refer back to her desperation not to get home it makes it sound so dramatic like such a, a battle when really she was just like taking the bus to the same office, taking the bus back every day. And uh, to make that sound like some sort of desperate flight to the death um, was top, that's top writing really, isn't it? You know, <laughs> um, and that sort of style throughout was just perfect, perfectly suited the person that Margaret was, to be honest. Um, which I really liked, yeah. Lovely, thank you. Um, yeah, she's very, like, I could really imagine all the colours really, like, being part of her personality that way. Um, I wonder if, yeah. Cormac, you had the same view? Um, I had quite a similar view, actually. Um, so I, I don't normally read uh, biographies or autobiographies. It's not really uh, my type of um, literature, but I was, I, I couldn't put it down. Um, I read it in two sittings, basically. And what I loved was uh, how Liz Jones would, uh, would take Margaret sort of, self-aggrandizing version of events and sort of uh, bring a more realistic sort of reasoning to it. I quite like that, you know, like you, you get you get the um, the sense of adventure from Margaret's tellings and then Liz just kind of brings it back into reality. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. But yeah, she does have a terrible taste in men. And um, I find it interesting that, uh, you know, most of her stories were about uh, like powerful women, uh, sort of like trying to make their own way in the world and she couldn't do it without the help of uh, men financing her and stuff like that. It was, it was quite sad in some sense, but no, it was really enjoyable. So one of you said that she was unlikable, which is true. I, I agree with that. Um, but she also was quite traumatised, I think, as a person that she left. I know it was part of the course at the time, but she had to leave her parents behind and her ayah and everything in India at the age of five. And she got turfed off to boarding school at age seven. 
and then she just got shunted from different boarding schools and no one valued her education she didn't get she didn't get on with either her parents <laughs> um and the era as well so I think you know you say just for to get to the office and back is a basic thing but it wasn't really for her because she wasn't expected to be independent and she had this sort of overbearing father she was having to go against his wishes and making a way as an actress and then a chorus girl for that and also the way she went around Fleet Street and sort of tackled all the editors to try and get her work out there it was actually brave for a woman of the time. You know, I agree with what you say about the way she writes because she leaves a cliffhanger. It, she was commissioned as it was supposed to be a popular biography. So I think she manages to do that because I read the book in two days as well, really quickly. Um, and she, she sort of, Liz Jones creates these cliffhangers at every every sort of chapter. Um, but as a, as a woman writer, she was really, she did have these interesting experiences. She was a sort of trailblazer, but then, of course, as the book says, the irony was that she didn't quite manage it in her own life. I, I do see that. Like, I do see that she was incredibly traumatised and that that, for a lot of her um, sort of writing, it's a genuinely incredible thing for her to be able to come out and continuously write. Like, for example, her late husband, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Caradoc Evans, he, like, the way he described her as being able to write almost effortlessly, I really appreciated that. I thought that that's such an incredible talent that she's so, I, I, I'm not sure to say the word lucky to have, but like the, what she makes out of it is genuinely extraordinary. It's the way that she sort of carries on her generational trauma for me that makes me think that she's a slightly unlikable character. And like Liz Jones does, like you say, an excellent job of leaving these little cliffhangers at the end um, of each chapter. But I find that sort of, um, especially towards Marguerite's later years, that she sort of, drags a bit almost that she turns this incredible talent into something that she just has to churn out to make this money and it's not something that like and she does seem passionate about it and I really found it interesting how she draws on a lot of her personal experience for these things in her books and what I don't get is why she won't really mention these things in her autobiography which is I believe full and frank um, that Liz um, references quite a lot it's a very well researched book um, but I, I just found it really interesting that as readers we can gain, or like as Liz has done, she's gained a lot more from Marguerite's fiction than what she's actually written in her autobiography. So I'm sort of asking um, here, d does everyone feel the same or does anyone have maybe any opinions on why, why she would f hide her life in fiction rather than introduce fact as fact, if that makes I any sense? Can... I yeah. have a really good feeling that it's part of the generational part. Her dad had this thing where he would constantly hide uh, the class, uh, the class aspect of it. And I feel like Margaret adopted that and never grew past it. A lot of her failings in life later on, the fact that she basically died with nothing, very much happened because she just didn't save. And she didn't think about the future. She invested and in, she didn't even know how to drive, but she bought super um, ridiculously expensive cars. She always wanted to live in a nice house. She wanted to lie about the kind of houses she lived in. She'd say, oh, it has like a big, uh, big uh, garden when it didn't have a garden, kind of things like that. And I feel like that is very much an aspect that she must have picked up from her dad and said, this, this inner failing of class is shameful and I do not want to show that so her lies that she kept on spinning and these great stories that she used to tell were all just a way of covering that up very very slowly and meticulously and it eventually bit her in the ass but I mean mm. honestly like good for her she she lived her she lived her life mostly like yeah. she, she I think did it. definitely it's it's a combination of that like British stiff upper lip and definitely a combination of utter delusion like you know, it, in part, like, you can see, you know, obviously she's trying to keep up this sort of, I have a chauffeur, I have the cars, I have the outfits, you know. Do you know how much my wardrobe is a drain on my expenses? Woe is me. Um, but then, like, reviving rogues and vagabonds three times, like, that's just delusion at that point. Like, that is not going to happen. It was worse each time, like... There, there must have been some element of just complete 
blindness to reality in those cases where she was just desperately hoping for something different to happen and it wasn't going to but she just kept trying um which is partly admirable partly sad like there was a war on rovers and vagabonds is a theater repertory company wasn't it did you mm. do you find that it was interesting about the, that theater world yeah definitely that was that was like i really enjoyed the chapters about the first uh, incarnation of Rose and Vagabonds. Like I thought that was so interesting, especially the the sort of observation about the fact that she kind of built a family around her within the theatre. Because like as a theatre person, that's always the atmosphere I found in the theatre is that like people become a family um, and you know you spend so much time together, you share so much, and it became like. Um, like Liz said, it became like her little um, her little world where she was the ruler of her own little world in India. And it was kind of a recreation of that, where she was the ruler of this little army of theatre people um, that she could dictate to and who loved her because she was generous with them um, in the same sort of dynamic. And I thought that, that was really sweet. That was a really like lovely element. And like, I felt so happy for her because she'd, like we said, she'd been shunted between all these different places for years. And then she set out in Everest with and finally had this little family around her. And I was like, you know, it's about time. It's about time you had some people who liked you <laughs> and were nice to you, you know, rather than all these people that you just push away all the time. But I thought was that it was really nice. It must have been a nice period of her life, really. Cormac, what did you think of the sort of... No, I... I like the word delusion when it comes to talking about rogues and vagabonds, but as someone who tries to be optimistic, I really admire Marguerite's personality um, for her almost, you no, know, it is blind optimism at this point. Um, Cormac, what are your sort of like opinions on that blind optimism, especially sort of concerning areas where she definitely should have fallen back, but didn't? Kind of, kind of tragic, really, because like she had such a powerful work ethic. I don't think I've ever read of anyone with such a you know tremendous driving force to try and succeed um and the fact that she never let any of her failures sort of crush her like she kept plowing forward especially with the uh with the theater stuff you know like she keep having to reincarnate it as, as you mentioned but the fact that she never sort of gave up hope fully on it um i found both beautiful and tragic because it is really and you know like trying so hard to make something successful and it never really working out but that was kind of her uh, her baby when you think about it like she, she really wanted that to work most of all same with her um, career as an actress and on, on stage herself you know like she never sort of gave up on it um but yeah yeah it was it was kind of hard to read when you say hard to read do you mean sort of like it was almost secondhand cringy or is it hard to read because there was just a lot of text in front of you. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, like, um, just like emotionally, just imagining what she was going through and uh, all these setbacks, you know, that, that's that's sort of what I mean. Like, it was like, I felt such sympathy for her. All right. I was going to say, one of the reasons she set up the um, theatre companies, Rogues and Bagamons, was because she wanted to create some work for her son. What are mm. people's feelings about her relationship with the son and, and how, and also his relationship with Prada Evans? I had really mixed opinions about her relationship with her son um as an only child myself I was like oh it's great that you know he's being sort of um coddled up to a stage you know protected by this mum just wanting you know wanting him to have a future that he's actually interested in because it is said that Nick um wants to be an actor it's not just Marguerite sort of forcing her ideals on him um, and I was like, oh, it's really nice that she has this opportunity for him. But equally, I sort of had to stop and think, is this her feeling guilty for splitting with Walter? Um, or is this part of that sort of motherhood that we never quite see from any other characters in the novel? Um, but also, um, I, I, I had to agree with some of the other people toward the end um, when it came to sort of, you know, Nick being 30, not having a job, not even looking for it, and becoming such a nasty person, just like um, Cara Doc is. I, 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 to read that for me, that was my sort of emotional is to see the abuse that she endured from her husband who she was so blindly in love with. And then also to endure the same abuse from her son. It just didn't seem at all fair um, to her. Um, 
and I, I didn't want to become a psychoanalyst and say, oh, I wonder if this is because of his past trauma from splitting with Walter, but it did pop into my head briefly. Yeah, sorry. No, I, I, I agree. Oh, yeah. it, like his early childhood was really disrupted and unsettled and that can't have helped. And then going from that to, to you know, the sort of loving but absent-ish mother always writing um, to living with um, a man who may or may not have been his father. Not a lot of detail about the relationship there, whether it was fatherly or, or stepfather figure to something happening, which we don't know. Um, who knows what that could have been or how traumatizing it was um, to living with a man who was weirdly jealous of him and basically kind of hated him and abused him and never getting on his own feet and and I just I got to the point where I thought Marguerite just needed to be mean she just needed to get him out of that house with Caradoc and just say look go like live somewhere else um and be on your own two feet get that confidence get away from Caradoc putting you down all the time and sort of do something but he never mm. got there and it was such it was so sad the sort of spiral that you could see coming and never anything happening to stop it it was so such a shame I thought you know uh, a lot of the the hatred that I not even hatred just the annoyance that I have with Marguerite is that aspect of it it's that she's never ever she doesn't really grow as a person and she has a lot of excuses to why and you can really like frame her as oh she's traumatized oh she has this issue oh she has this issue but at the end of the day she doesn't take responsibility for it and doesn't try and protect her children her, her kid and she doesn't try and it's really awful to say like she doesn't try and be a mother but she doesn't for a long time when she does start trying to be a mother she tries to do it in the way that she knows by uh paying for him to go through like theater and uh really like setting up a lot of safety nets so it doesn't feel like he can fail and there's this constant uh access that she basically allowed to her son the trauma over and over and it became to uh, i'd say like at the midpoint uh to a uh, late point in the novel that he was kind of becoming a uh, Caradoc in a lot of ways and that was mainly due to like exposure but also there was just a lot of I'm trying to think like the best way of like really really putting it because I had like a lot of... I'm trying not to just sound like oh my god like grow up but um uh she has this way of prioritizing herself and her own happiness and even if it exposes her to trauma um at the cost of her son uh, for example when they eventually do leave she gets back with him like i think only a few days after uh, when they move back to is it New newport newport or Newquay? um new cross new cross sorry and i wrote all this down that's in a much more succinct way um, you're right it was only a day that they were separated for yeah and it was she had her obsessions and her her needs for progress was great but it very much costed her uh, a lot of reputa like reputation with her son and understanding like if she's in a household where she is constantly being berated by her husband and then her son is also being berated by the husband and she leaves and then immediately gets back with him I feel like that that is going to cause e an even like bigger layer of trauma on top of all of that and it kind of and there was this codependence that arrived from it like you originally have there's I think there's three different people in the novel who say I will kill myself if you leave me uh and it happens with the uh Caradoc who's a piece of shit like straight up like we expect this he's like if girl if you leave me I'm going to kill myself and then you see in a letter that she writes that she does the same thing to her son where she's like I don't think I can bear be away from him or I might kill myself and it's like okay like that's a bit a bit dark and so when eventually he threatens it too, it wasn't even surprising. There's just this constant threat between all of them, which was just like codependence and this need for misery that none of them could actually break out of because they were all monetarily reliant on each other. The issue is that none of them seem to take care of themselves. So that was like a really long tangent, but it's, yeah, it was just a lot. It was a lot.
with th those relationships that just didn't didn't work. And I think that's what's really, really well written about the book. It's you're painting these characters, uh, these these humans as actual humans. They're you can read them like characters because the prose in this book is like so it flows so well, but the realities of it and the fact that you can really make you hate these characters and these people just says like, hey, this is really well written. What about Wales in the book? You know, obviously it's not all set in Wales. I think it's like half of it. And then she meets Craddock Evans almost exactly the half point. Um, and then she's kind of back and forth a bit in different places and then ends up in Abu Dhabi with the story of the magic stone or whatever it was. Um, so there's quite a few sort of different settings of Wales, including Aberystwyth, where the repertory company, so she sets it up first. Because you were all Aberystwyth students, I think, aren't you? Or were. Did you feel that it was an interesting portrayal of Wales itself? I want to let Cormac answer some of this one, because out of the three of us students, Cormac is the only one who lives in Wales and is the only one who was raised in Wales. So I want to hear that opinion first. Yeah, it was... Um... It was kind of strange. Like uh, I've never really read uh, read anything about people living in Wales, and it was um, uh, certainly not the uh, experience that I had. Like she painted as such a beautiful, uh, <laughs> uh, beautiful place and very sort of mythological. You know, she's always speaking about um, like the land of wizards and stuff like that. I think that was something she said. Um, it's also strange, sort of reading a setting of. I'm familiar with a lot of these places um, that she sort of lived in and frequented. Um, and I'm trying to figure out now where the actual theatre was in Aberystwyth because it must, like, the building must still be there. And I was thinking it might be the Commodore Theatre as it is now, but I think it might be somewhere else. But that, that's, that's yeah. what I thought of when I was reading that sort of section of it. It was close to the yeah. quarry, wasn't it? I thought it might mm. be underneath the Constitution Hill. The yeah, building, that's sort of what I had my sort of vision of as well. Yeah, I was imagining, like, yeah, behind the Glengower, sort of, like, up yeah. that little bit, yeah. Yeah. But it kind of like, uh, yeah, hit close to home. So it was um, sort of weird knowing that I was walking the same streets as this uh, kind of controversial figure, um, especially Caradoc, like very controversial. Um, I wonder if we sat in the same pubs at one point, years apart, you know. And the, then the way he, when he was, they were in New Cross then, when they came back and, and they had it, uh, I think it was wartime possibly, and they had all these soirees. They were quite interesting, I thought. You know, because Aberystwyth seemed quite drab at the time, but then there was this house where there were all these artists and writers and composers coming to stay. I really liked that bit. Uh, several times I put down the novel and like looked up on Google Maps and I was like, how far is this? Can I travel here in a day? Sort of, especially talking about Aberystwyth and the surrounding country. I was trying to work out where, um, oh, what's the name of the place that they lived that begins with B? Oh, there's a picture of it. You know, it's it's the house with the red... Brunawalon? Yeah, Brennawalon, yeah, that's it. And I was no, trying to figure out if I could sort of walk there. But then upon seeing the picture, I was like, that is so, it's such a nice little house compared to all the things she described that went on in it. Um, but I also really liked the idea that she was having these um, like little, little soirees, as you sort of say, um, that bring a much more colourful picture of the war um, than what I'm used to reading about, especially the the sort of, a lavishness of all the illegal rations that they seem to have like you know bacon and 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 oh, was alcohol and stuff like that and I really wondered I was like how far do her connections go where is she getting these black market items from is there more than than what we're reading it really piqued my interest to be honest that we do love a little bit of an illicit story um which is why I was really interested in sort of like Nick's legitimate father I was like oh I wonder who it is I wanted it to be Captain Walters because he was just he was the only good man to her in the entire novel and she should not have let him go but I'm going to stop ranting about that because otherwise we'll be here all night. <laughs> Actually um, quite a good point you bring up about like uh, all these connections and stuff that she seems to be cure all these rations like a lot of stuff that we sort of learn about I, I don't I, I find it hard to believe a lot of it or like not all the information adds up like um, her relationship with Ar Armageur is that how you pronounce it? Um, like she said that it was just a marriage of convenience, um, like a business deal. I, I'm not so sure it was. I find it hard to believe that. Um, I think her, she's very naive. Um, I think Josh mentioned earlier about how she has very little character development. I think it's, um, she certainly never, never loses that sort of naive sort of view. She's very easily manipulated. And yeah, I just find it quite hard to, to trust what she actually says. And I find that strange in, a, in an autobiography that kind of exactly is a very unreliable narrator. 
Um, and I just wonder what you guys um, sort of thoughts on that. Like, is there anything that you don't really believe that she did or said? Any sort of events that spring to mind? The bit, the bit towards the end, right at the end, where she's talking about the Abu Dhabi, uh, where they have like a magical stone, whatever it's called, um, and that she's got together with a Kenyan Gordon, and the Gordon, the corporal or captain, whoever he is, and then suddenly she breaks off with him. And I ends- really liked that element of the book, actually, that, like, oh, there's so many gaps and there's so many things that are unrealistic about her biography... I really liked sort of filling in some of the gaps with general history because she lived through like so many different times. She, you know, she was in India and then she was in England at, and she was growing up at the start of this, you know, emergence of the new woman. And then she was writing through the war and that, you know, she lived through so many um, like new time periods, different time periods. Um, really interesting his- historically and sort of having the gaps of what she doesn't tell us filled in with actual history was really nice like, like oh, I'm learning so much about what the time was like there and like, you really can sort of think like oh her parents probably were like this because that was the accepted norm at the time and then obviously the more personal things you know I was sort of thinking for a while like how much can we infer about her real life from her novels? But then towards the end, like where she was literally writing a book about, you know, a woman uh, who is living in Wales with her her angry, mad Welshman husband and their emotionally unstable, distant son. And I was like, maybe, maybe all this, we really can just read her extended fiction books as a just a really long biography. You know, and I thought that was really interesting how parts of it were her own sensationalized biography, parts of it was real history, parts were, you know, articles, and parts were her fiction. And I thought that all sort of patchwork together um, gave you quite a well rounded image because you could temper what she said by. The historic facts and and sort of vice versa it, it was really nice really an interesting way to sort of learn about a person I think. Josh um your opinion on like this is also something I generally really wanted to ask um I did have a list of questions but those seem to have gone out the window um I really really wanted to know people's opinions on the whole magic stone thing as I was reading it I was like how desperate is this woman getting because I, there's sort of mentions of her spirituality peppered throughout the book and I thought that was great I was like oh it's cool that she's got like you know she dabbles her toe dabbles her toe she dabbles she dips her toe in certain things in certain places and she's you know passed it down to her son and even her late husband eventually sort of has this not unhealthy interest in the occult and I thought that was pretty cool until it got to the stone and I was like wow she's really twisting and like she's really grinding as much money as she can out of these smallest objects and to use her spirituality in that way really interested me but equally I wasn't sure how much I believed as like a genuine authentic you know a flamboyant marguerite move or how much of it was just her eventually realizing that she is getting desperate for money um but also I really like what you said Gwen about the um about the sort of pedophilia insinuation like I was reading that I was like there is no other bridge to gap here um but that was in her autobiography full and frank wasn't it and Liz Jones has just sort of laid it out there yeah but it's quite that that chalet on the hill I can you know if you can remember the estuary with Abu Dhabi the other side of it if you've been on the train to and from Aberystwyth I could really picture that this sort of rundown um lodge sort of Swiss chalet place and then people crawling through the garden to go and see the stone in a little grotto. I found that entire last part surprisingly in character. Like, I just, when you see that someone is like kind of delusional and stuff, you, you notice that they hook on to certain obsessions and they get weirder and weirder. And I saw that the author had very much put like little hints like in the occult, because I'm like, that came out of nowhere, but I guess that's going to build up to something. So when I read it, I was like, she claimed that a woman was cured of like 
bedridden arthritis because she touched this stone and the stone's now probably sold to some rando as a doorstop or something in America. Like, girl, what the hell? Come on. Like, <laughs> what is what is going on here? Like, that is... You are cutting it, like, real deep. And I, I the thing is, I don't really know about, like, the history of, like, Wales and spirituality and stuff like that. So I don't know, like, if, like, that kind of, like, occultness was popular at the time. Because, you know, after World War II, you always have, like, you have a lot of weird things happened. And a cult was one of them. So I wasn't I wasn't too sure, like, if it was, like, incredibly just, like, it felt uh, kind of anachronistic in a way because it felt, like, pyramid scheming in a lot of different ways. So I was like, did she just, like, start this odd, like, television pasta thing going on here just for money? Because that's insane. It, it was, it was so, it's so weird, but it's also, like, it's so her. It's so her to twist like this tiny, in like insignificant object and make a huge story around it. Because that's that is what she did her entire life. Like, she can. She had this amazing talent where she could take anything and turn it into something interesting. Her all of her like to write two books a year for, I, I, it was like forty years or something. You have to have like some really good ideas. So. It's not. It's it's very much. I don't think it is very much like out of the ordinary for her. But also, I was like. This is weird, but because I also haven't read like many of her, any of her books. To be fair, like, did she ever write about the occult? Like, that's something I'm interested in. Okay. Were there warning signs for her? <laughs> I think I think Liz Jones does set that in the context because she says there is an interest right from the late Victorian period right through to the fifties or forties in the occult. So, because even Craddock Evans, who is this big, who appears to be all sort of cynical and rational. He was interested in it as well, wasn't he? He went to London. Um, so I think it was part of the society, and I think Liz does sort of sketch that in. But I thought it was interesting how it seemed to be the thing that she's the positive thing she sh shared with the man she lived with and with the father, because they bonded, didn't they? After she left the boarding school, they bonded over this interest in the occult. And then Caradog was interested in it as well, and then her son was interested in it. So it seemed to be the only kind of thing almost that was a positive thing in her relationships. Um, I was going to say, I really like the idea that, like, I was so surprised that her father bonded with her over the occult, this strict, insanely sort of, um, I, I don't want to say Victorian, but this, this, you know, morally strict man is just so open he's like yeah I'll teach you about the occult it's like they have not bonded at all she's desperate to escape him after the, the in the coming years and you think you build this reputation of this man he's not a good man and suddenly they bond over the occult and it's like of all things I would not have expected this rational military man to just start going on about you know whichever various aspects they must have talked about but um that's something I found really interesting that sort of threads every connection that she makes since is through some sort of occult sort of ism, except with her long-standing friend. Monica? Yeah, Monica? I think it is Monica, yeah. Who's just a, like only a child when they sort of make friends, which I thought was really interesting. Sort of really speaks to Marguerite's mental state. Um, I also had a question to ask um, about a certain quote in the book, um, which sort of really does highlight the feminist theme, but I don't want to give away spoilers. How do you feel about the quote? When she felt her very life depended on her success. Men like Sevilla and Armiger held the key to her future. I wondered how you guys felt about that. I almost forgot about Sevilla, I'm not gonna lie. So compared to the rest of the book, he's so insignificant that he takes up such a big chapter. So yeah, I, I wondered how you guys felt about that quote. It's on page 79 in case you need a reference. I thought it was really interesting because it sort of epitome is that fundamental um, contrast uh, irony irony in her life that you know it's always about men isn't it it's she was desperate not to marry and be trapped by a man and yet she was constantly in relationships with men constantly living with them and you know she was one of these new women that was financially independent but was she because she was reliant on the the higher ups, the higher ups were all men. She she may have been this this new woman journalist, but the editors were men, or almost exclusively, other than her 
few female mentors who it does sound like she built strong relationships with the women who were in the industry which is really nice to see and you know most of those relationships ended up being sexual which was you know sad but clearly a comment of the time um that they were living in which is an awful shame but yeah I've, that that kind that quote kind of sums all that frustration up in that she was so desperate to be single and independent and sort of out from under this shadow of of men her father and the looming future husband but she had to rely on these powerful men to get it and in doing so ended up being trapped by them because she was just so naive and so you know at, and the times hadn't changed as much as the glossy women's magazines wanted everyone to think you know it was yeah it was kind of a kind of a shame for her so that's a really nice point I think um when I started reading it I thought she has all the makings of like a feminist trailblazer but it just didn't end up that way like as, as I read her journey it just sort of became more and more apparent that she's not going to become this like tremendous feminist and I, I find it strange that she didn't agree with the suffragette movement um that much and um, despite all of her writings being about you know women making their way and like her, her fierce sort of um fight for education for her, for herself you don't really see her sort of further that on in the rest of her life and I found that kind of strange yeah it's a good point about the suffragettes I wondered if anyone else has some theories perhaps why she herself seems so aligned with the movement and yet doesn't express open support for it. Any theories, any context? Yeah. She's a massive Tory and she was from an aristocratic background. I think that's the answer. You know, her instincts were all quite right wing. I mean, it's weird that she managed to live with Craddock Evans, who was left wing, but she was a Tory. I think Liz mentions that, didn't she? The one thing I was saying, you were saying about you know, working in like Fleet Street being male dominated, but you should remember we haven't talked much, talked much about the genre of romance writing, romantic writing. But her readers were overwhelmingly women, weren't they? And they gave, they, it was her sales to them that she based all her wealth on. I was thinking throughout, obviously, it keeps coming back to this fact that she wrote the selling stuff um, that it sold and it sold to these female readers and yet it was never given any respect. Um, you know, it's for, it's for factory girls. It's light, frothy romances. Um, and I just thought how sad it is that thinking hasn't changed on that front. People still consider romance for women to be sub a sub genre you know it's it's not literary it's not you know it's never going to make the canon it, it's it's just frothy rubbish trashy romance is a phrase that comes to mind and I just thought well no it's not because it it's important you know it was important then and it's important now like she says it offered escape from the awful lives women were living and it does just the same now. And, you know, it kept reminding me sort of of that sad fact of life that romance authors still aren't respected in the way they should be. And it's such, it's so sad. <laughs> if anyone had some sort of uh, closing remarks about the book that they really wanted to make, for instance, who you disliked the most, um, or just even how you felt summarised into a single sentence or um, something like that, I'll start. I loved this book, even if it did drag toward the end, but I felt that Marguerite eventually ended up as one of her heroines who desperately wanted to be independent, but did, did end up falling back on a man. I'm not going to comment on her political leanings, but if she did open her mind a little bit more to, you know, embracing the suffragette movement, maybe, maybe she would have ended up a little differently and not ended up in... Um, a situation where she is relied upon by every man that she knows almost. I think it was about motherhood in a way because it's so much about her relationship with the son and I think she's making up in I don't know this is a theory but the way she allows the men in her life to, to depend on them it's like she never had a proper mother herself and she wasn't very good at being a mother in terms of caring and she couldn't 
clean the house or you know, she relied on other people all the time but she kept them going you know she paid for the food they, that they ate and kept them going so it's sort of a weird it's about a weird type of motherhood for me in the book for me the book is like a really really well written tragedy it's you really you really learn to root, to root for marguerite like you really do because she's so strong and you you see this drive and it's it's so sad just to watch the the decisions that are being made kind um constantly even though it happened years and years ago it feels like you're there in real time because of how well the book is written it really it like it's, it is amazing how modern this book how it is just because of how it reflected the time before because it is exactly the same now and it's really it's really nice to see it and I'm very much uh, excited to actually try and read one of her novels. I think it's amazing what she achieved knowing the, de- uh, the, de- the decisions that she made like I felt so much anxiety watching her make these bad decisions and move from sort of abusive exploitive relationship to another um, and I just wonder what she could have been had she made better decisions or, you know, had a stronger support network or a more nuclear family or something like that. Just I wonder what she could have been. Um, and I admire what she did become. Yeah, she's a contradiction and she's a phenomenal character. And I'm surprised more people don't know about her. Thank you very much for all your opinions. Um, thank you to the lovely Gwen for providing books. Thank you. For Josh for his excellent opinion. Amy for her outspokenness and Cormac for just being the best till last. Anyway, <laughs> thank you all very much. Uh, hope to see you again soon. New Welsh Reviews Multimedia Programme is sponsored by Aberystwyth University.